Welcome Mount Vernon Baptist Church to Youth Sunday. Before we uh, begin worship, I'd like to read the first two verses from Psalm 89. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself.
believe that through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, that he has done everything necessary to save you from your sin? Yes. And do you trust in Jesus as the Savior from your sin, as the Lord of your life? Yes. Well, Michael, based on your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Married with him in baptism. You may stand. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. 
Good morning, good morning, guys. You can be seated for just a moment. Uh, I'm going to ask the graduates to come up on stage and line up here behind me. This is a graduate recognition Sunday morning. Uh, there's so many moving parts. You guys come on up here, line up here, and don't keep the order. Uh, there we go, there we go. You guys come on up here. Uh, aren't this a lovely looking group? Aren't they handsome? <laughs> Amen. I don't know if you remember what it's like to graduate from high school and all the hard work and effort when you first start. And, and you're in middle school, you feel like it'll never end. And here they are. We all know where they're at right now. This is a moment in time for them that's going to move so quickly uh, into the next phases of life. And in just a moment, we're going to have them come and share uh, where they're going to be graduating from or have graduated from, where they're kind of heading to next. So you all know how to be praying for them. And it is our commitment as a church to pray for them into the future and as they go along. It's a sweet time. Welcome. If you're here for, for the first time at Mount Vernon Baptist Church, ah, you've come on a good day. This is a good day. We just got to see uh, baptisms this morning. Praise the Lord for Michael and Matthew. We just ask that God will continue to work in their lives and to, and to progress with them. This is what being a, a follower of Jesus Christ is about, is being obedient to him from the very beginning. As soon as he touches your heart and calls you and says, I want you to be my child, we do that. We just, we just give our hearts and lives to Jesus always. So um, thank you for that. We're going to also say if you're a first or second time visitor, please fill out on the little bulletin you got some information. Throw it in the, the offering plate or in the boxes at the back doors you go out so we have a record of your visit. That would make us happy. We'd also know how to pray for you if you'd write those on there. But without any further ado, let me do this. I'm going to just say that uh, parents, congratulations to you all. We're excited for you and for the, the young people that are up here. And we're going to start on this end. Uh, we're going to make uh, this young man come to the microphone first and he's going to tell you his name, where he's graduating from, kind of generally where he's going to. And then, uh, Pastor, if you bring those up here, I apologize. I, I miss, I gave you bad directions earlier. Uh, Pastor Locke and I have a, a gift from the church to each and every one of them. And then we're going to pray for them before we send them off this stage. My name's Isaac Sams and I'm graduating from Bright Sun Academy. And I don't currently plan on going straight to college, but I'm currently working for my dad at Dynamic Signs and Graphics, so I'm just going to keep working there and see where that goes. Hi, I'm Miley Parrott. I'm graduating from Wakefield, and I'm going to ECU to major in theater, and I hope to pursue that. So, yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Alyssa. I graduated from Sela Academy, and I'm going to go to Wake Tech. Hi, my name is Savannah. I'm graduating from Millbrook, and I plan to go to Wake Tech and transfer to state for elementary education. Hi, my name is Anna. I'm graduating from Broughton High School, and next year I'm going to East Carolina University and majoring in music education. Hi, my name is Reef Green, and I just graduated from the prestigious Green Home Christian Academy. And I plan to continue a, in pursuing a degree of business administration at the college at Southeastern. I'm going to make you guys shift over here behind me. We're going to pray for, for these. You've heard their names and where they're going to and what's going on with them, but we know that God has plans for them that, that, that they don't know yet. <laughs> But they're being faithful and they're stepping in that now. So it's our responsibility as people that have been connected to them, that love them, to pray for them. We also have a couple of uh, college grads. Got David right here. I'm going to make him raise his hands. He snuck in on us this morning. Thank you very much. Um, also, uh, Tabitha Sam has graduated. She's up in uh, the western part of the state. She wasn't able to be here today, but there are college grads today. But it's a big deal for them, so let's pray and ask God's blessings on these young people. Father God, you are good, and you are faithful, and you are kind, and you prove it over and over and over. You prove it, Lord, by giving us every breath we have, the, the, the blood coursing through our veins, Father. You are a giver of those things. 
And whether we acknowledge you or not, Lord, you're still God. <laughs> you still hold this universe together and you are still good. But thank you, Lord, for those that have committed and commended their hearts to you and trust you, Father. They have said, we want you to be the Lord, the master, and the boss of our life. And Lord, um, we pray for these young students, especially those that have made that commitment to you, Lord. You've shown yourself faithful. They worked diligently. They worked hardly, probably with a lot of prompting in the past. But, Lord, they're, they're owning it now. And so I pray, Father, you would just encourage them with your Holy Spirit. Help them to continue to work hard. Lord, don't allow them to be distracted by the world and the things in it. Help them to be focused on you, to spend time in your word, Lord, to spend time with you. And not only in prayer, but letting you speak to their hearts and minds. Father, I pray very specifically that you would add to them and into their lives men and women, teachers, friends, uh, co-workers, people that would love you and love them and encourage them in you. And for those that don't, Lord, we pray that you would give them grace, just as you've given us grace, that you would give them, Lord, um, the ability to speak love and truth and the good news of Jesus Christ into the lives of those that don't know you. Use what they're studying, Lord. Use everything in their life as a, as a way to bless yourself and to bless your kingdom by using their talents and abilities, their skills, Lord. Not only to bless them and their families, Lord, but to bless those they come in contact with. And then, Lord, through the furtherance of the gospel, through each and every one of these that are here today. Father, we commit as a church to pray for them and to lift them up. Lord, to remind them, uh, put them in our hearts and minds so we would be reminded of them to lift them up in the future. Lord, we pray for not only these graduates, but the college graduates also, for David and for Tabitha. And Lord, if there's any others that we're missing out there from this congregation, Lord, just bless them. You know we love them. But, Father, you are God, and this time is yours. So we honor you in this. We honor you by saying thank you. Thank you for blessing these families. And thank you for providing this opportunity in the moment of your worship service, Lord, to just tell you thank you and, and to encourage them by saying that you love them. And you want the best for them. Let them be reminded of that as we leave this place today, Lord. We pray all of these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to continue worshiping together.
That's the 
that's not normal, but they did a great job this morning, so. Previously, my name is Isaac Sams. Um, believe it or not, I'm not the lead pastor here. <laughs> but uh, today I will be preaching and will be in Ephesians 2 1 through 10. So if you please turn there and then stand as we read God's word. And when you're there, say you're there. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places, in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his worksmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just praise you and I thank you for this day, Lord. Um, I just pray that as we look into your word, God, that you would give us all understanding, um, that you would just give us all the desire and the thirst to be Seeing your spiritual truths, Lord, I pray that we would um, just be able to walk away with applications and that this, this word would be life-changing for us, Lord. And I uh, just pray that you would please speak through me now, Lord. Uh, I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. See, I told you I'm not in charge of the sound. So, but so as we can see, um, and or just a bit of context for this letter, it's a letter written by Paul to the church in Ephesus, and uh, there's kind of three splits in the text that we can see. We can see um, first how lost we are in sin, then we can see how God has saved us, and then we can see God's plan for us after He has saved us. So if we look in verse 1, we immediately see, it says, we are dead in our trespasses and sins in which we once walked. Boom. Right there. We're dead. We're, we're completely dead. There's no life there. Now let's define trespasses and sins. Well, we can define trespasses as violations of God's commandments. And we can define, define sins as offense or disobedience against God in thought, word, or deed. And it says in which, you, in which we once walked, because once again, this is written to believers in Ephesus, but this does tell us that when we are dead in our trespasses, we are actively walking in sin. And, but does this tell us that we, sorry, 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 but what does this death mean for us? Well, it's not a physical death specifically, but it's more so talking about our spiritual death. Now, what is spiritual death? Well, it's our eternal disconnection from God. Like, imagine putting a shattered light bulb in a lamp, and the lamp is perfectly fine, but the light bulb is completely shattered. That, that light has no 
chance of lighting up because the light bulb is shattered. But the, the light has a job to do, and if it's not doing that job, then it's cut off from the power, of course. That is the lamp. But this shattered light bulb is an example of our shattered spiritual life. We have no chance of spiritual life because we are completely broken in our trespasses and sins. But it's not like we're just broken, but we actively have lived in such a way that we have broken our spiritual life. And if we keep reading, it says we're following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, which is essentially just Satan. So we're living in such a way that we're following Satan, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. And who are the sons of disobedience? Well, that's just those who are dead in their trespasses and sins. So if we're following the course of this world, then we are sons of disobedience. Okay, so he continues to paint this picture of us in our spiritual death. Living in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and mind. Now, why would us living for our desires be so bad? Well, I desire to eat five plates of food at an all-you-can-eat buffet. But what good is that doing me? I'm full after one plate. Why do I need four more? Well, because human desire is impulsive and selfish. But that is just one small example of human desire. If we take it further, we desire things like wealth, relationships, power, drugs, alcohol. We as humans want a thrill. We want, we want an adrenaline rush. But all these things are temporary. They're just in the moment, in the instant things. Because I may feel fulfilled after I eat five plates of food, but when I'm in the bathroom throwing up, it's not a coincidence, but my overeating has earned my sickness. But why are desires so wrong? Well, as it says, we're sons of disobedience, and we're following the course of the world, and it goes on to say, by nature, we're children of wrath. So if we, as sinners, are in a world full of sinners, doing every sinful deed we think of with no regret or remorse, just living our life, how, how can our thoughts be good? How can our desires be good? And it says we're children of wrath, which God's wrath is just his justice against sin. So if we're children of wrath, we are naturally sinning against God. Now, we know God's wrath is against sin, as we can see in 2 Kings 22. During Josiah's reign, when they repaired the temple, they found the book of the law. And it says in 2 Kings 22, verse 13, Go inquire of the Lord for me, and for the people, and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. So we see God's wrath is upon sin. So how are we children of wrath? Well, we have a sin nature. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, sin didn't just enter them, but it entered the world and affected everything around them. So we, as descendants of Adam and Eve, born into a sinful world, have the natural and uh, desire to sin against God. And we can also see the people living in the world are called sons of disobedience, so then they must also be children of wrath. So we have this picture of us spiritually completely dead, living for ourselves, carrying out every sinful thought with no remorse or regret. Our very nature is to do evil against God. It even says in verse 12 of chapter 2 in Ephesians, Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So we are completely dead and cut off from spiritual life, without any hope. But praise God, that's not the end. 
It goes on to say in verse 4, But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us. Well, we could say, how is God merciful if He let us do all this stuff to become spiritually completely dead? Well, God knew from before creation ever happened how much we would sin against Him. But even still, He created us just because He loves us, which is more than any of us deserve. That's why it's called mercy, getting something we don't deserve, like God's love. And we can see His mercy in verse 5 when it says, Even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. So we are no longer dead and lost, but alive in Christ. Now what exactly does that mean? Well, because of God's grace, and God's grace is His favor upon those who have broken His law and sinned against Him, this spiritual disconnection from God is now repaired. Through Christ's death and resurrection, we have a bridge to God. But how are we supposed to act like we're different than before? Well, because we are. It says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So now, if we look back at that lamp, we now have a brand new light bulb. And we are reconnected to God as our power source of life. But the best part is, the light is Christ. Because we aren't just raised back from the spiritual dead, but we're raised in Christ. Which means, we aren't the light bulb anymore. But He is. And He's an a eternal light. So it will never shatter again. And you'll never have to change it again. And with the light of Christ leading the way for our lives, we share His desires and now seek His will. Now it goes on to say, by grace you have been saved. But if you look at how we were before Christ, how in the world could we have earned it? But God knew we could never earn it. So in His grace, He saved us. When we were dead in our trespasses and sins, actively sinning against God, God saved us. Like I said in verse 5, even when we were dead in our trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. Now verse 6 says, And raised us up with Him, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ. So God continues to lavish His grace upon us, not just raising us from the spiritual death, But He raises us up to the heavenly places and seats us with Christ. And we can see in Ephesians 1, 20-22, it says that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule, power, authority, and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. So God raises us up and seats us with Christ, who is above everything. And I'm not saying we become a God or anything, but I'm saying we get to taste Christ's authority, who is above all, and we deserve death. How good is our God? And it just keeps getting better. In verse 7 it says, So that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness towards us in Christ. So God raises us up to the heavenly places so He can continue to show us the immeasurable riches of His grace. So our relationship with Christ is one of the biggest ways we can see God's grace in our lives. But one of the main things we need to take from this is God's grace doesn't end at salvation. But we as believers, when we backslide into sin over and over, or or start thinking, oh, I've, I've stepped too far over the line this time, 
God's grace isn't the, the 10 chances of God's grace or the 16 ounces of God's grace or the, the 5 pounds of God's grace, but it's the immeasurable riches of God's grace. Paul had to use riches and immeasurable just to describe it. And the word for immeasurable in the Greek basically means to throw over or beyond anything. So we can never overwhelm God's grace. But that doesn't mean we should justify our sin with God's grace. We still need to fight sin. But God's grace is always there to catch us and bring us back to Him when we stumble. It goes on to say in verse 8, For by grace you have been saved, through faith. It is not your own doing, but is the gift of God. So this verse tells us that by the grace of God, we even have the opportunity to have faith in God. He tells us it's not our own doing, so we can't earn it, but it's the gift of God. Now, imagine if a drug addict that was just starving and shattered, regretting every, every choice they had ever made to get into a position like that, saying things like, I would do anything to get out of this position. And someone just walks up to them and says, hey, I have a program. I help people get off the streets, get clean, and we give you a place to live and a job and we'll feed you. All you have to do is want to change. Well, the person that is addicted to drugs and homeless would probably be like, what do you want from me? And the person helping them goes, nothing. I just don't think anyone should have to live like this. So they accept the help, and their life takes a complete turnaround. And without the person that helped them asking them, the addict would just start telling people how much the person did for them, how, how transformative their actions were for them. So we should be that way with Christ, because Christ didn't just take us off the streets in this life. But Christ has taken us from our eternal death and separation and has raised us up with him to, to sit on his throne with him. How are we not, as believers, going and sharing that with everybody, just running around taking this word to, to whoever will hear it? And it's not just through the, the actions that the, the person that helped the addict that they know the difference in the addict's life, but it's the way the addict is now living that they can also see the difference in this person's life. They can see that now that they're working a job, they're off drugs, they have a sense of purpose in life, they're now all like, wow, this, this person has truly had an impact, truly changed this person's life. How kind would this person be? They, they want to meet him. They want to know him. And this addict didn't earn this person's help, but this person had grace upon him. This person just decided that, that I don't think people deserve to live this way, so I, I want you, I need you to come with me so I can help you. That is how we are with Christ. We couldn't earn salvation. We couldn't earn his love. We couldn't earn his favor. No. God showers his grace upon us just because he loves us. He saved us for all eternity just because he loves us. Even though our very nature is to sin against him, to do evil against God. His, his love is more powerful than any of our sins could be. Now, this is a gift for two reasons. It's important that this is a gift for two reasons. Not only should it inspire us to share, but once again, we could never earn it. So the only way we could experience heaven is if God gave us this gift. And the only way to heaven is to live a perfect life. And I don't know about you, but I'm pretty far off from that mark. I'll, I'll tell you what, I couldn't make it on my own. But if you think you could, you should probably talk to somebody. Uh, now verse 9 talks more about why it's a gift, saying, 
It's not a result of works, so no one may boast. Well, what is one of the most dangerous sins? Pride. And imagine a world where we could earn our salvation. Just people, people going, yeah, I, I got mine first. I worked, I worked way faster than you. I got my salvation first. Another going, well, I, rescue, I, I, I adopted 12 rescue dogs. Like, come on. I, I, that's pretty good, right? Another going, well, I was, a, I was a surgeon. I saved dozens of lives. Well, of course, that's not how it works. But it may be funny to us, but some people truly live their, live their lives this way, thinking, oh, if I do enough good, I, I'll be fine. You know, it'll outweigh the bad when I, when I get to heaven and God is weighing the scales, you know, I'll, I'll be fine, you know. But no, our, our bad is not, is not able to be leveled out by our good because it says in the... I, I'll be honest, I didn't, I didn't look up the exact reference, but our good works are dirty rags compared to God's works. So we could never earn our salvation. But one of the main reasons is what unity would there be in Christ if we could earn our salvation from Christ? Like, how would the church be unified? They wouldn't. It's a competition of salvation. They would think... Oh, I'm better than you. I got my salvation faster. They, they, they wouldn't be unified. But we as believers have recognized our sin. We, we are united in the fact that God saved us. We are united in the fact that God's grace is better than our works could ever be. And we have acknowledged that we're hopeless without Him. That, that there's nothing we could do. So is salvation a result of works? No. But is our works a result of salvation? Absolutely. And we can't boast about earning our salvation, but we can boast in the Lord saving us. And that is how the gospel is proclaimed. Now, verse 10. What do we do when we are new creation in Christ Jesus? It says, we are his worksmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we might walk in them. So we see once again, we are new creation in Christ. And as a result, we have the desire to seek God's will. And when we are actively walking in God's will, we are walking in a way that we do the works of he is preparing for us. That is, once again, where we see that our works are a result of our salvation. So, we're not paying back a debt. We're not earning our salvation. But we are so transformed by Christ that all we know to do is to do the good works He has for us, to, to seek His will and in His will are the good works for us to do. So, if you have not experienced the grace of God in your life, and you are still living in this spiritual death, just know, God loves you. And He loves you so much that He sent His only Son to live a perfect and sinless life so that he could die on the cross for the sins of the world, and arose from the dead three days later, conquering death, so we could have eternal life in him. All we have to do is confess we are sinners, and repent, and believe in him. And you don't need to clean yourself up before you go to God. But when you come to God, he will clean you up. His grace is what washes us clean. We could never earn it on our own. We could never clean ourselves. Our, our towels and our, our fancy body washes, I can't get rid of your sin. But the grace of God is what cleanses us and what unites us. So if you want to pray this, or if you want to learn, learn more about salvation, talk to any of the pastors here at Mount Vernon. So... The three main takeaways from this passage should be 
One, we are hopeless in sin. Two, but God's grace is stronger than our sin in any challenge we could ever face. And three, let's tell everyone how good our God is with our mouths and our actions because He deserves it. There's nothing else we could do less for Him because that, that, that is the minimum because we don't have any part in salvation. We just have to accept. So we need to share this with others because it is the good news. It's where it's got a name from. It's the good news. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just praise you and I thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you um, that we were able to recognize the graduates. Um, I thank you that you gave the opportunity for um, the youth to do the band and gave me the opportunity to preach, Lord. Um, I just thank you for your grace and your mercy, Lord. You're saving us, Lord, because we could never earn salvation. There's nothing we could do in this world. There's nothing we could do in all eternity on our own to earn our salvation, Lord. But you came and saved us, God. So I just praise you and I thank you for that, Lord. I pray that we would all just leave here bubbling over with um, praise for you, Lord, so that your gospel would be proclaimed just through our actions and through our words, Lord. I just pray that the whole church would be have a flame ignited in us, Lord, that we would be known for our evangelism, Lord, known for our reach on the community. I just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Our God is a God of immeasurable grace, isn't he? Amen. We got even to, to see that today in many different ways and forms, and one of those uh, was through baptism. So if I could have Michael and Matthew come up here, and if I can actually have your family to, to come up here with you. Like your, your immediate family, yeah, please. Awesome, come on up. I'm not going to make you speak, don't worry, that's all, that's all good. <laughs> but, uh, so because you guys are baptism, as a, as a way to, uh, to remember, hey y'all, good to see you, welcome, welcome. I see you. Come on up. What's up, guys? Man. So again, these are our new brothers. Uh, take them in your minds, in your hearts, so that you can be praying for them. Pray for them today. We're, we're going to pray for them uh, again. But uh, pray for them today, even in your own hearts, for their, for their walk with the Lord. Because as we know, baptism is not the finish line, but it's, it's only the beginning. They got a life to run the good race of living for Jesus and making him known, just as Isaac was talking about. So we have uh, two certificates of baptism, so you can remember this. So this is Michael. Here's your certificate of baptism. And Matthew. Here you go. So let's praise God for what he's doing in our church today. <laughs> we have Pastor. All right, wonderful. Uh, we're going to pray for you all uh, in just a bit, but I've got a couple of announcements. Actually, before we even give announcements, have you been blessed this morning? Yeah. Amen. <laughs> to see how our Lord is working in our church, but specifically to see how he's working among our young people. Uh, has got to be a thrill to your hearts. I know that it's a thrill to my heart just to see how God is working in y'all and how he's working in y'all up here. Thank y'all very much. Praise team. Let's praise the Lord for them as well. Oh, man. I mean, it's just, yeah, there's, there's so much that I could say, but all I really want to say is just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord 